Hello! Welcome to an adventure. Um, we are coming to you live from the Newman Library at uh, on the campus of Virginia Tech. Today we're exploring the Olive Treat Diary from 1897 on episode 8 of Archival Adventures. I'm Anthony Wright Day Hernandez, the Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech, um, and I'm going to be exploring this along with you. Um, I do have a couple of acknowledgements to make just before we begin, so I will dive right into those. Um, we acknowledge the Tutelo and Monacan people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live, and recognize their continuing connection to the land, water, and air that Virginia Tech consumes. We pay respect to the Tutelo and Monacan nations and to their elders past, present, and emerging. We also acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Smithfield Plantation. At any point from 1774 to 1865, the Preston family enslaved 40 to 100 African men, women, and children on this land. We pay respect to those souls and acknowledge that Virginia Tech is undeniably tied to this legacy. Further, we acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Solitude Estate, which enslaved at least 30 African men, women, and children on this land. We acknowledge the contributions of the Fraction family and other enslaved persons in the creation and emergence of Virginia Tech as a major land-grant university, in accordance with the university's efforts to transform an historic location into a site for the interpretation of the African-American experience on campus and in the region. Um, I know this is somewhat boilerplate now. A lot of places do it. I truly think it's important to make these acknowledgements, which is why I choose to do them at the beginning of every stream. Um, so I hope that you appreciate at the, the bare minimum there of, of just acknowledging um, the facts of the location that we are currently in. Um, anyway, <laughs> welcome, welcome to the stream. I hope that you will enjoy um, Today we are looking at a diary, um, which there are some implications there that we, we can discuss if you're interested in doing so. Um, just the fact that when the diary was written, the person writing it, Olive Treat, probably didn't think that it would end up in a, an archival collection um, with people reading parts of it online in the year 2021. Um, it is part of our collection. Uh, she is an interesting person. I've not read the diary myself. I don't know exactly what we'll encounter other than what's in our finding aid. Um, but I, I'm interested in finding out. So what we're going to do is I'm going to start by throwing us over to the screen share so I can pull up the finding aid. We'll see what it says we're going to find, and then we will start looking at the diary itself. So I have a screen share item there. Hi, Hannah. How are you today? It's good to see you. Um, so here, uh, I know I've showed it before, but it's been a couple of streams since I showed the process of finding information about our collections. So this is the Virginia Heritage website. Um, I'm currently on the advanced search page. Let me go to the home page so you can see the actual web address there. It is vaheritage.org, and it hosts finding aids for all of, most of the cultural heritage institutions in Virginia. Um, so you can see here the list of repositories, and we are in here under Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University. Um, you're just getting some work done, really pretty work too. Really, what, what, um, what are you working on that is so pretty? I'd be interested to know. i um, gonna go ahead and search for Olive Treat, the subject of our show today. Um, and I did mention there's been some database work happening and a lot of the entries are currently duplicated. Uh, in here, but we'll go ahead and pull up this one. A Guide to the Olive Treat Diary, 1897. Um, and we'll see what this says we have. Oh, I'm gonna 
remove the query part of the URL so that I just have the text without the highlights of the search terms. There we go, that's better. So the abstract is a really great place to start, get a little bit of information about what we can expect to find. Uh, you're putting a wedding set together. Her engagement ring is a really pretty aquamarine. Um, I love that, I mean, I like aquamarine. I think, I think colorful stones are, are nicer than diamonds personally. Um, that sounds really cool. I'm, I'm, I hope that she likes it, Hannah. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm gonna read the, the abstract here. Um, and it basically just says, Diary of Olive Treat, a resident of Chicago and New York and wife of mining venture capitalist, Harry W. Treat. Entries focus on trips to New York and British Columbia, social activities, and Harry Treat's mining business. Um, there is a little bit of biographical information here, which I think is good to know going into looking at a diary. Um, we have Olive Marion Grief Treat, daughter of Charles and Grace Grief, was born on December 19th, 1869. She married Harry Whitney Treat, who lived from 1865 to 1922, a graduate of Cornell University and a successful Chicago mining capitalist on June 4th, 1896. So she married when she was 33, if my brain is doing the math correctly, which it doesn't always do. Um, the Treats moved to Seattle in 1902, which was uh, five years after when this diary is from, <clears throat> and had two daughters. Harry Treat engaged in various business ventures, including the development of mining properties in British Columbia. Olive Treat was among the incorporators of Seattle's Children's Orthopedic Hospital in 1907 and was a charter member of the city's Sunset Club in 1913. Um, so those activities, which I think are really, really good activities to pay attention to, um, are after when this diary is from. This diary is from five years before they moved to Seattle. Um, so we're probably not going to be touching on those particular works that she was involved in. But um, whenever I'm looking at materials about women from history, I think it's very important to focus on what did they do rather than who their husband was, which is what typically gets written about them. And even here, a lot of what we know about her is that she was married to Harry Treat. Um, so I think it's, it's very good that we've, in our finding aid, included information that she was one of the incorporators of the Children's Hospital and she helped charter the Sunset Club. Now, I don't know what the Sunset Club in Seattle is, um, I assume it's a social organization of some sort, uh, and she was she was a charter member of that. Um, in the scope and content note, we do see that this this collection is a single diary, maintained by Olive Grief Treat, a resident of New York, Chicago, and Seattle. Um, entries commence in Chicago on January first, eighteen ninety seven, and continue through the year nearly uh, nearly uninterrupted. The first is in a different hand, presumably that of her husband, and during two occasions of a week or more in which she did not have access to the diary, entries were made by her husband, whom Olive refers to as Kim. And so it's mostly a social diary. It's very interesting to me that her husband, A, had access to her diary and maintained it when she was unable to. That to me is quite interesting. Um, though the diary begins with them in Chicago, much of their year was spent traveling, a month with family in New York, uh, then in March, a month long trip to British Columbia, and then another trip to New York via Quebec in midsummer. They left for New York again in September, 
and she seems to have not returned to Chicago for the remainder of the year. So there's frequent mentions of recreation, boat races, tennis and croquet, and entertainment, including many the theatrical productions. And in British Columbia, there's mention of details of her husband's mining business, in which she was actively interested. There's also a few loose materials that had been inserted in the diary, including, including three photographic portraits of the treats and several small pencil sketches. So we will take a look at those items in just a moment. Before I dive in there, I wanted to look at one thing. Just give me a second. Ah, yes, okay. Just wanted to make sure that I have the information at my fingertips so that when I'm doing the wrap up in a couple of hours, I remember what I'm talking about next week because I keep forgetting to do that. Uh, anyway, uh, we're gonna switch over to the document camera so that we can take a look at this diary. Document focus. Okay, yes, there's a big gray blob behind me now. Um, which is as it is supposed to be at the moment. <laughs> Just, sorry, leaning out of screen there. Okay. <laughs> that gray blob is the archival box that this diary lives in. And I have not unboxed it yet because I wanted to do that on camera for you. Start by taking the cover off of the box. And inside we have an archival folder sitting on top of the diary itself. Um, let me see if I can zoom out a little. Nope, <laughs> wrong direction. Okay, that is as far out as it will zoom, which is fine. Um, so we've got a little folder here and this has the items that were inserted in. We will look at those in a moment. Uh, but you can see the diary here is actually covered in tissue paper and tied with this cotton, uh, this cotton tie here. Generally, tying them like that is something that we'll do um, when the bindings are less than perfect, uh, meaning when the book has a chance of falling apart. I don't know the condition. Um, I, when I pulled this off the shelf and went to look at it, I saw that it was closed like this and I kept it this way so that I could um, open it up on stream for you. There we go. So I'll save that little string there and we'll take the tissue paper off and we can see the diary itself. Ah, uh, yeah. So the, the actual binding here is falling apart just a little bit, which would be why it's tied. Yeah, A.O. Kinnaman, I'm happy to do so. Um, so here we have the Daily, Daily Journal, 1897. So clearly a, um, a produced, marketed product for someone to keep their journal or their diary. Um, this one is specifically for the year 1897. It includes a calendar for 1897. So even back at the, in the late 19th century, like this is kind of like a journal that you would expect to find today if you were finding like a, a daily planner or something like that. Um, for the year 2021, it's a book. It's got places to write things down and the calendar for the year. And even back at the turn of the 20th century, in the late, late 1800s here, they were making products basically identical to something you could find today. Yes, this is a bit larger. Um, 
and, and the ones today would come in lots of multiple different colors and might be a plastic cover, and, and this is bound more like a, <clears throat> a regular book, but it's very similar. Um, so Excelsior, Daily Journal for 1897, published annually for the trade. Um, oh, and it's got some information in the front here. We've got principal cities, uh, giving population information. This is interesting to me. Um, woo! Sorry. Uh, I held down the button a little bit too long there. Um, let me zoom back out so that we can actually see what's on this page. There we go. <laughs> All right, so we've got principal cities, including, what is this, population, distance from New York, and difference between mean and standard time. It's quite interesting to me that distance from New York is, the, it is one of the important pieces of information included there. Um, wow. So at the time, New York had a population of 1.5 million. Chicago had a population of a million. Philadelphia had a population of a million. But note that they list Brooklyn separately from New York City. And then St. Louis, Missouri is the, the fourth or fifth item listed here. That to me is quite interesting. St. Louis, Missouri showing up before things like DC or uh, Los Angeles or any of the places we would think of as, as major hubs today. I don't think people immediately think of St. Louis as one of the, the majorly important locations to pay attention to today. Um, Boston, Baltimore, San Francisco, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Buffalo, New Orleans, and Pittsburgh. That's quite a lot of cities before DC even shows up. Um, wow, Detroit, Milwaukee, Newark, Minneapolis. Like, is... I think the only California city on here is San Francisco. That's interesting. We've got Richmond on there. Des Moines is on here. Leavenworth, Kansas. Rutland, Vermont. I have never even heard of Rutland, Vermont. But it was important enough to be listed in this diary, in the pre-printed part of this diary. That is a, an interesting surprise to me. Uh, and then we've got some information on states and territories, square miles, when settled, when it was admitted to the Union, population in 1890, and the number of electoral votes. So just like basic information in the diary here. Interest tables. Honestly, I don't have enough personal knowledge of interest rates and, and like just, my brain doesn't do well with mental mathematics. I, calculators are my friend. Um, Wolfram Alpha is my friend. <laughs> the fact that they've got tables on here for what 4% interest is? over a certain period of time on a certain amount of money is baffling to me. Uh, so according to this, 4% <clears throat> interest on $9 for 12 days is one. Four percent interest 
on $1,000 for 24 days is 2.67. I'm uncertain why it is of so much importance to know four, five, and six percent interest on increments up to a thousand dollars over a year's time. Like why it is so important that they chose to print that in the front matter of this book. That to me is a conundrum and, and I would be very interested to know if anybody has ideas about why there are interest rate tables in the beginning of this personal journal. Clearly this was a product for people of wealth. Um, let's see, the fourth segment here, table for foretelling the weather. If the new moon, first quarter, full moon, or last quarter happens, between midnight and two o'clock in summer, it will be fair, I think is what that is saying. If the new moon, first quarter, full moon, or last quarter happens between 10 and 12 in the morning, in winter, it will be cold and high wind. <laughs> welcome, welcome, 16-Bit Eric. Thank you for bringing those 35 people over. Um, welcome to Archival Adventures. Uh, this is my regular Wednesday show from 2.30 to 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, today we are looking at the Olive Treat Diary from night 19, from 1897, um, Olive Treat was a high society woman who was married to Harry W. Treat, who was a venture capitalist in the mining industry. Um, and she, uh, she was involved in founding a children's hospital in Seattle, as well as the Seattle Sunset Club. Um, this diary is from about five years before they moved to Seattle. Um, and so we're looking at it, uh, kind of seeing what, what there is from this, um, this high society woman's diary from uh, over 100 years ago. <laughs> so, but yes, welcome in Raiders, um, uh, Adventures of Tony, Wraith Fay, uh, Chandra, thank you for the bits, Chandra. Uh, Lord Portico, thank you for stopping by. Thank you for the bits. Um, <laughs> I insist that you archive this for me, please. So uh, all of the Archival Adventures episodes, um, while they are not saved on my personal Twitch channel, um, they will expire on my personal Twitch channel. They are all available on the Virginia Tech, U Virginia Tech University Library's YouTube channel. Um, so, um, I don't know, Alice, if you can drop the link to the um, library's YouTube channel into the chat, that would be lovely. <laughs> Thank you, Sincerious, for redeeming a stretch. I can always use a stretch. Um. <laughs> and uh, if you are watching on my personal channel where the raid just came in and you do not already follow uh, the Virginia Tech University Libraries Studios Twitch channel that is VTUL Studios. Um, that is the main home of this show as well as our um, tabletop role-playing game show, uh, The Role of Play, which airs on Friday evenings at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, I will be doing a one-shot uh, Sometime mid-March, I'll be running a game of Lasers and Feelings. Um, all of our shows for the one-shots are based on literature, and I have chosen to do the Space Opera series by Elizabeth Moon, uh, the, the Vada's War series. So, um, wow! Um, <laughs> Alice, thanks for dropping the, the role of play uh, 
command in there. It looks like there's some out of date information in that command. But, uh, but yeah, coming up we'll have um, the Vada's War series from Elizabeth Moon using lasers and feelings. It should be a fun, fun time with a space adventure going on, or space opera going on. Anyway, um, thank you everybody for coming. Wraith Faye, thank you for redeeming a hydrate. I will take a sip of water. Um, to do that on this show, because I can't have the liquids near the materials, I'll be sliding out of frame for a second. <laughs> or I'll, I'll, I'll slide back and take the drink from back here. Um, anyway. Oh, A.O. Kinnaman, um, were you talking about the Sherlock Holmes session that the information just went into the VTUL Studios chat? Um, it was an amazing session, and it looked like you had a lot of fun in it. Um, okay, so we were just looking at some of the front matter that's pre-printed in this diary. We haven't actually gotten to any diary entries yet. Um, the one that we were currently looking at is a table for foretelling the weather. Um, <clears throat> the nearer the time of the moon's change, first quarter, full, and last quarter are to midnight, the fairer will be the weather during the next seven days. The space for this calculation occupies from 10 at night till 2 next morning. The nearer to midday or noon the phases of the moon happen, the more foul or wet the we weather may be expected during the next seven days. The space for this calculation occupies from 10 in the forenoon to 2 in the afternoon. These observations refer principally to the summer, though they affect spring and autumn nearly in the same ratio. The moon's change, first quarter, full, and last quarter happening during six of the afternoon hours, that is, from four to 10, may be followed by fair weather. But this is mostly dependent on the wind, as is noted in the table. Though the weather from a variety of irregular cause, causes is more uncertain in the latter part of autumn, the whole of winter and the beginning of spring, yet in the main, the above observations will apply to those periods also. To prognosticate correctly, especially in those cases where the wind is concerned, the observer should be within sight of a good, uh, a good vein where the four cardinal points of the heavens are correctly placed. <laughs> Beth, it reminds me of the random weather table I just made for my D&D campaign. <laughs> yeah, um, that's, that's an interesting table here. I think it's probably not as reliable as modern meteorology. Um, let's see here. On the next page, we have some domestic postage. First class, letters and all written matter. Oops, sorry. Slide that down a little so it's in frame. Letters and all written matter, whether sealed or unsealed, and all other matter sealed, nailed, sewed, tied, or fastened in any manner, so that it cannot be easily examined, two cents per ounce, or fraction thereof. And special delivery, or a special delivery 10 cent stamp when attached to a letter in addition to the lawful postage shall entitle the letter to immediate delivery at or within one mile of any post office. Postal cards, one cent each, with paid reply, two cents each. That is uh, significantly less cost than today, and I don't think we would ever have postage printed in a book like this today, um, just because the cost of stamps changes. <laughs> but apparently it was static enough at the time that they felt that pre-printing it in an 1897 diary um, would give good information. Uh, we've got foreign postage. Let's see if I can get that centered here. To all foreign countries except Canada and Mexico on letters, five cents for each half ounce. To Canada, including Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Manitoba, and Prince Edward Island, letters were two cents for each ounce. Books, circulars, and similar printed matter, one cent for each two ounces. 
let's see, to, to Mexico, letters, postal cards, and printed matter are, were the same rates as the United States. So one cent per two ounces. And then we have a, a section here on weights and measures. Trying to not have it be diagonal, but I keep turning it the wrong direction. There we go. <laughs> uh, measures of weight. Avoir de poids, I believe is how that is pronounced. The, the italicized word there under measures of weight. Avoir de poids, one pound equals 7,000 grains. Is that what that says? I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. Sixteen drams, one ounce, sixteen ounces, one pound. Avoir de poids weights is something that I'm unfamiliar with. I've not encountered that term before. Um, then we have troy weights, which I am familiar with. Troy weights, one pound equals 5,760 grains. Um, 24 grains is one penny weight. And then we have apothecaries weights. One pound equals 5,760 grains but 20 grains is one scruple. Three scruples is one dram. Eight drams is one ounce. And then we have metric. One kilogram equals 1,000 grams equals 2.2 avoir de poids pounds. Interesting. That is, a, that is terminology that I have not encountered before. Uh, measures of length, customary. 12 inches equals one foot. And then metric, 1,000 millimeters equals one meter. So they're calling it customary versus metric here. Down at the very bottom of the weights and measures, we have capacity of boxes. Hannah, it includes troy ounces. Troy is what is used in jewelry. Avoir de poids is the standard we use in the kitchen. Interesting. Somehow we have lost that term, but we still use the measures. That's very interesting. It's interesting to me that they have a capacity of boxes section. 12 inches square, 11.66 inches deep, equals approximately one wine barrel. <laughs> so we've got boxes approximated using wine barrels, bushels, pecks, and gallons. We've got a bushel and a peck. And if you know musical theater at all, that's the only reason that bushels and pecks uh, made me smile. Oh, and here we have a table of wages by the week. Oh, you know, I can also zoom out and then it's not as hard to center. Table of wages by the week. $3 wage for a half hour is 0.02 and a half, so two and a half cents. The wages on here go up to $24 an hour. <laughs> right there, you're singing Bushel in a Peck now. Um, I, these, I don't think, I mean, yeah, you would have to adjust for inflation to, to translate to today's wages. Um, but the idea that $24 an hour was not out of the question in 1897, um, the fact that this table goes that high is quite interesting.
they have on here like $24 per six days, but they've got on here $24 for a half an hour as a, an item listed on this table. And I think it's wages of $24 a week is what it means because if you look at the table, you only get $24 under the six days column. So it's telling you if you only work a half an hour at $24 a week, it's 20 cents. So I think that is how this table is meant to be used. The table is based upon the usual calculation of 10 hours to a day. So in order to get $24, you would have had to work 60 hours in that week, six 10 hour days to get that $24. So not nearly as good as today, but still interesting information. All right, we're done with the front matter now. We've come to the diary itself. We have Friday, January 1st, 1897. I'm going to zoom out a little bit so I can get the writing in here, and we will attempt to read it. I do not know whether I will be able to make out the handwriting. Um, it did say that the first entry and a couple of weeks throughout the year are in a different hand and that they believe that that is Harry Treat, her husband, who was writing those entries. Um, I'm writing upon this glorious new year Let's see, no, in writing upon this glorious new year, we have very much to be thankful for. Our, uncertain what the word after our is. Uh, that's the fourth line down at the very end. But our something, Oh, it looks like somebody was trying, Simsilica, were you trying to post a link? If you could let the mods know what the, um, what the link is to. Um. Ooh, Wraith, entire, that might, that might work. Our entire little family seems well and promising. Um, most likely this is a fountain pen of some sort. Um, the, the rake on the script is not nearly as severe as, a, as some that I've seen. Um, it is, this is nearly straight up and down. Um, it's, it's quite common for the writing in the 1800s to tilt significantly to the left so that the um, top of letters is to the left of the bottom of the letters. Uh, so this doesn't have nearly the slant that I've seen in some others. Um, oh! <laughs> Sim Silica was giving a link to the wiki page for ma the mathematical table. Thank you, Alice. Um, and then you can see that when we get into the different hand, which is um, Olive's hand itself, her writing actually tilts to the right, which um, over time, that is a fairly common shift. Uh, with older, older items, the tilt is to the left. Newer script tends to tilt more to the right. Um, uh, Harry's writing here is almost straight up and down. Um, but yeah, this appears to be a fountain pen of some sort. Um, we are unhampered something today by business partners. Our 
Wow, I, I do not know what that word is. And so same thing here, if you, if you look uh, five, six, seventh line down, the very last word, or the, um, the second to last line, the second word in, basically the letters are just up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. You can't tell, is that an M, an N, an R, an E? It looks like there's a couple I's in there because there's some dots above them. But really, it's just up, down, up, down, up, down. And so you have to kind of make it out by context clues. Um, ooh, beginning today. Let's see. We are unhampered beginning today by business partners. Yeah, that seems to fit. Um, and then our... milling prospects look well mining maybe it's mining i'm i'm uncertain winning <laughs> i don't think it's winning i'm look well and are all together and look well and all together we are happy our I'm uncertain. Mine, it might be mining, and he was a mining venture capitalist, which is why I guessed that word. Um, but it's uncertain. And so uh, one of the interesting things about looking at old documents like this, sometimes someone's handwriting will make perfect sense to you and you can read it super easily. And then you look at someone else's handwriting and you're just like, I have no idea and you struggle and, and struggle and struggle. Um, the actual letter formation here, they're not distinct letters. It's like this word here. It's literally just up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down with a couple dots. And that is fairly common. I'm like, I'm not sure whether they expected anyone to ever be able to read them. Um, but also, that's how people wrote. And, and so deciphering them can be an adventure. <laughs> Hence, we've got archival adventures going on. Um, let's see what the first entry here from Olive herself is like. began our reform for this year by setting our alarm clock to ring at 7 a.m. We scarcely slept. I'm, I'm unsure, uncertain that this is reform, but that's the only word that it looks like to me. By setting our alarm clock to ring at 7 a.m., we nearly slept We nearly slept something the break I'm uncertain on some of these words here. Uh, over our coffee and felt very miserable. We nearly slept something the break. Fact something over our coffee and felt very miserable, rained almost all day. I'm not gonna struggle too much on individual entries. If I can't make out what they say, we'll move on. Um, Cause I, I know there's some stuff in here about attending the theater and, and other things like that. So I'm not gonna focus on one that's basically, we set our alarm clocks and it was raining. 
<laughs> um, Sunday the 3rd, attended church. Next door, uh, Baptist. Spent the afternoon in our rooms. This evening with the walkers rained all day. <laughs> she has better handwriting than your brother. Oh, it could have been breakfast. Yeah. Um, yes. Yes. It was definitely breakfast, not a break. But there was a break in the word, and so I was reading it as two words. But it was definitely breakfast. <clears throat> Went down early with Kim to pet, or to set ribbons at Marshall Fields, or get, to get ribbons at Marshall Fields for Mother Treat. Had luncheon in Mrs. Walker's room. and packed all the afternoon. Dined here and went down to the Grand Opera House to see Sal Smith Russell in Bachelor's Romance. <clears throat> Mr. Hamlin saw us come in and would not allow Kim to bring his, would not allow Kim to bring his seat. to buy his seats. Got it. So they went to the Grand Opera to see Bachelor's Romance, <clears throat> and someone that they knew saw them there and wouldn't let them pay for their seats. Came back to the hotel and had a little supper uh, sent to our room, to which the walkers came after their Return from some theater. Seven months married today. So they went to the Grand Opera and saw Bachelor's Romance for their seven month anniversary. On Monday, January 4th, 1897. <clears throat> This is interesting to me. How are you all liking it? <clears throat> Do you have any questions at all about archives or why we have this? That's an interesting question. Uh, <laughs> also, if you look at the pages themselves, you can see they've been inked. It's fairly common. Um, I don't know a lot about uh, book preservation personally. I know this is a, a somewhat common thing. I believe it has something to do with long-term durability of the books as well as just looking neat. Um, but I don't really know all of the specifics of why the edges were coated, um, but I do believe that it has something to do with uh, longevity of the, the pages themselves and that it protects them in some fashion. I just don't know all of the details on that and would have to do research to really answer that. Um, there are still some places that will do that today. Um, if you go, uh, so the printing office, um, <coughs> brain, brain is forgetting words right now. Um, the
The government publishing office. That is what I was trying to go for. The United States government publishing office. Um, where they actually print all of all sorts of like official documents and things like that. I went and had a tour of that <coughs> a few years ago when um, Davida Vance Cooks was the printer of the United States. Um, and they still did the actual like <coughs> method for some of the things that they printed there. Um, and I got some nice little like note card slash bookmark things that they had done that on and that they do as giveaways because they said when they give tours that's one of the most popular things uh, people want to see is the, the, um, the coloring of the edges of the pages. Um. <coughs> Anyway, so that was that was interesting. Um, packed trunk, luncheon party at Mrs. Avery's. So about 30 women. Kim and I had dinner up in our room and then carried our valuables into the Walker's rooms and left them under Mrs. Walker's care until my return. Got up early, sent, sent trunks off, and then waited about until it was time to go to the station. Both of us are fully blue. That's what those words look like to me, both of us. Carefully? Uncertain what that sentence is. <laughs> it would take some, some work and then may never be transcribable. It might just be like brackets, blue question mark, because that's the closest approximation of the word that I can assign there, but I'm uncertain that that's what the word is. Uh, met Mary, Mary someone at the station. She and I left Chicago on the 1030 train for New York. Awfully blue. Possibly, Wraith. And I, I appreciate you helping to try and figure out what the words say. Um, one other thing that I have learned uh, in working with old, old script writing like this, old, old like cursive writing, um, is that sometimes you look at it and you just can't make out the word and you walk to somebody else and say, hey, can you take a look at this? And they get it immediately. And it, it just has to do with looking at it and, and like I could be reading through this and come across a word that I can't make out that one of my coworkers can. Sometimes there's handwriting that I just can't make head or tails of and somebody can just read it with ease. Um, it's, it, it's, uh, it's a skill a little bit to be able to make them out. Um, so the more you practice, the more you can get better at reading old script, but um, also sometimes you just can't make out someone's writing. <laughs> um, left Chicago on the 1030 train for New York. Wondered before we had been, let's see. Wondered before we had been en route an hour whether I was going to be able to endure the separation from my beloved three long weeks. So yeah, it, it probably was 
that they were awfully blue because it sounds like they were separating for three weeks while she was, like he was staying there and she was going elsewhere for three weeks. Um, we talked, read all day and went to bed about nine o'clock. I got up and at 12 thinking Phil might meet our train at Buffalo, but he was not there. You're amused that her T's look like current cursive S's. Um, yes, and that is, I've seen that construction of T's before. Um, it's also common that you'll see something that looks like an F that is actually a double S um, that was quite common in older writing. I'm going to skip a little bit ahead and see what's happening later in the year. But um, here we also have, <clears throat> so she's also using a fountain pen, <clears throat> pardon me. But a lot of the time, her letter formation is a lot, the, the letters, the path of the pen itself is a lot more narrow, more similar to what you'd get <clears throat> from a modern ballpoint pen. But it's definitely still a fountain pen. Let's check in on the 1st of February. Kim went downtown early uh, went over to Gainers and then with Emily started over to Brooklyn to luncheon with Mrs. <coughs> Skeel. I'm uncertain about that name. Uh, lost her letter of invitation and mistook the time, mistook the time she set and arrived three quarters of an hour late. <laughs> Seems like February 1st was not the best day for her. Back at 530. Um, received bad news. <clears throat> from the Volcani? Vol volcanic Uncertain. Dined at Mrs. Friedlieb's. Had a particularly nice evening, though. <laughs> so, uncertain on all of the words on this page, but apparently not the greatest of days. Had her schedule wrong, showed up late. Uh, received bad news when she got home, but had a lovely evening. <laughs> so clearly if I, if I went day by day, we would get a fairly good like narration of um, kind of what her year had been like. Um, here we have on the 4th of February, 
Married eight months today. Theater in the evening. Uh, to Lyceum to see Hackett in First Gentleman in First Gentleman in <clears throat> I don't know. I d she's She's written something and then written over it. Um, interestingly, originally written in pen and written over in pencil. Um, and it's the title of the play that they went to see. And I don't happen to know what play it would be, First Gentleman in E something. Um, so. Sounds like a great little diary to animate. Interesting. <laughs> um, yeah. <clears throat> so I know we have a number of, of diaries in our collection like this. Um, and there's definitely more archival information about <laughs> uh, uh, Coxic. Welcome. Um, I am currently doing a show called Archival Adventures, where we show off and I share materials from the um, archives at Virginia Tech. Uh, so today we are looking at the Diary of Olive Treat from 1897. Um, so this is a, a diary that a woman um, kept during the year 1897. Sure. So on uh, Saturday, the 6th of February, 1897, let's see, Dr. Claudius at Fifth Avenue Theater to see Holland Brothers. Wonderfully stupid play. <laughs> Very bad weather. House all the evening. So, apparently, Dr. Claudius is a wonderfully stupid play. I am unfamiliar with that play, but it seems like she enjoyed it. <laughs> First Gentleman of Europe. Thank you, Ray Fay. <laughs> I had wondered if that was what it was, but the letters just didn't seem to line up for that. Uh, <laughs> um... Kim, I took breakfast. No. Oh, it's a thing that she does in her script when she's writing and she's got and and then a word. She'll basically do a plus sign that leads immediately into the first letter of the next word. So this is not Kim, I took breakfast. This is Kim and I took breakfast at the uh, Netherlands at 12 noon, then a short walk. Von uh, N I M P S-E-L? I am uncertain on that name. Uh, von somebody, Albert, Aunt Lee, and Dago, extra for dinner. So they had guests. Uh, and then some more names, let's see. Sue. Emily, Hal, Kim, and I made calls in the afternoon. Aunt, no, Anne. Anne, somebody. 
same for us at home. And I'm uncertain. It's and something a number called. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> So yeah, this is this diary is is just day in the life after day in the life, short little descriptions, um, mentioning like the uh, in the finding aid it does say um, that there's mention of attending theater things like that. She's made a special note in here on Monday the twenty second of February that it is Washington's birthday. Oh seems that she may have been sick. <clears throat> Monday the 22nd of February, it says better today. Um, out of bed for a little while, which she has crossed out. Uh, mother. Mother J, all day with us. No, Mother T, of course. So her mother-in-law spent the day with them, telegraphed, ooh, that's a long word, C-O-U-G-R-A-T, no, oh, no, it's congratulations, <laughs> telegraphed congratulations to my old daddy. Um, Cox, like, this diary is from the collections uh, here at Virginia Tech, so um, I'm an archivist at Virginia Tech, and uh, I pulled it from the archives. I decided that for this week I wanted to pull one of the diaries that we have, um, and I pulled it off the shelf, and so we're looking at it today. Um, basically, th that's... That's all there is to it. Uh, it's something that was collected by our archives. Um, it was acquired in 1988 by the archives. I'm uncertain how often it has been used. Um, I do believe that I had maybe pulled it once before because I had someone come in who was looking for um, material about uh, women's experience, their day-to-day -day life experience from a, a certain date range. Um, and so this had um, information in it that was potentially useful to them. But otherwise, I don't know that anybody particularly knew that it was here. Um, that said, the treats, uh, Harry W. Treat was a venture capitalist. Um, uh, that is who's referred to in here as Kim. Um, and he was a mining venture capitalist who uh, primarily was fo focused in um, Seattle area, Seattle, Washington. And uh, Olive Treat, whose diary this is, was his wife. Um, this diary is from about five years before they moved to Seattle, but I do know that there are archival materials available about the Treats. Um, I can say where those are. Let's see. Um, the Harry W. Treat family collections are included, let's see, Archives West. Let's see, where are these? They are at the Museum of History and Industry in the Sophie Fry Bass Library in Seattle, Washington. Um, so they have a number of materials about the treats located there at the Museum of History and Industry. Um, I don't happen to know why this particular diary was added to our collections here. Um, it, there's no information included with it to tell us why it's here instead of uh, somewhere out in Seattle.
let's see, February 26th, a Friday. Kim and I went down together to his office. Uh, came back to hotel for luncheon. Mrs. R Root brushed Kim's hair and I winded, no, I don't know what that word is. <clears throat> it's got an I-D-I-E-D, -E something, the rooms for the afternoon. Uh, Coxic, honestly, I don't spend a lot of time reading diaries. Um, so this is the most interesting one that I've read. This is the only one that I've read. Um, most of our time as archivists is spent uh, like organizing and describing the material that we have. Um, this show on Twitch is to help kind of promote what we have, share what we have with with the world, and um, so I've done a number of different episodes of this show uh, focusing on different things, and this is the first time that I've pulled a diary. We've, I've been doing this show since the beginning of January, once a week, so, um, so, so far this is the most interesting diary that I've read. Uh, Something the rooms for the afternoon. My last day at house. Had a number of collars and the thermometer only registered 52 degrees in my little parlor and uh, caught, <laughs> wait, caught cold in consequence. Kim stayed downstairs and wrote up his books. More callers after dinner. <laughs> Wraith Faye, uh, I'm making you want to take a road trip where? <laughs> if, if you're wanting to come here to look at this book, um, you absolutely can. Special Collections is is open. Um, all of the materials that I show off on here are available for the public to to use. Um, and so definitely possible, but also uh, your local library um, or local academic institution archives would probably have similar materials. Or if you particularly want stuff on the treats we have this one diary here but like i said there's a lot of a lot more information about them out in seattle um but yeah <laughs> let's see oh wow the handwriting has become a little bit harder to read here on the 8th of March, um, left hotel in left hotel in something for the north side at one o'clock to make calls. Me, but made something, but had a stupid. Oh, my. Had a stupid, ignorant driver and had to drive up. Had to give up finding three places. Shopped for Kim at his office on my way home and found
and found something. Found something with a sick headache. Put him right to bed and my had my dinner upstairs. So I'm not sure what this word is. It's referring to a person, it might be a name. I don't know. But they had a headache, so she put them to bed. <laughs> Coxic, I will happily stretch. Thank you for redeeming the stretch. Mm. Let's see, we're in March. We're always in March. We've been in March since last March. <laughs> uh, let's see, I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit, see what we find. Ooh, here we have a, an entry and then a change of pen and a change of handwriting. So this could be interesting. Watched the watched the something. Watched the somebody felling the preet trees. Clearing the lower side, and in the evening went down in the mire. Part of the way in the part of the way in the bucket with Kim, and the rest of the way on the ladder. Very interesting, especially in the. 60 foot level. Okay, so this is definitely talking about mining. So this is gonna be information about her husband's mining business. I don't know what this word is. C-H-R-I-P-A something. I, I don't know. Uh, and then felling the preet trees, P-R-E-A-T trees, which if that's what the actual word is, it's a mining term and I'm unfamiliar with it. <laughs> March hasn't ended. It just goes on and on and on. All right, Oksana, welcome. Great trees? That's possible, I suppose, that it would be great trees. And that does, that does look kind of like her G's. Um, so she went down in the bucket with Kim and the rest of the way on the ladder. And she said it was very interesting, especially in the 60 foot level. But then it switches hand to Kim, Kim's writing, Harry's writing. Um, guided by a, uh, I mean, it's giving a name here, guided by A.S. Goring, possibly, today, walked about 20, Walked about 20 minutes over the mountains and examined mines as follows. Surprise, Silver Tip, Victoria, something cracker, I'm not sure what the first word is there, and 
Dundal. And many other properties which are something properties, prospects, which are mainly prospects. And then my brain is just not not willing to parse his handwriting any further. <laughs> uh, so they were looking at mines for him to potentially invest in, it sounds like. Okay, but I think it's worth trying to figure some of this out because uh, returned something and my lovely, I, I can't make out all of the words, went down mine, <clears throat> no other woman would have, no other woman would have had the courage. The mines are something the world of her. All the mines, the miners all think the world of her. No other individual has the faculty in its perfection of getting on with all classes. No other has the intelligence, nor judgment, nor disposition, nor loyalty. Uh, they get any know her, worship her, love her. <laughs> so it's an entry in her journal about a visit that they made to some prospective mines that he was looking at investing in, and she went down into the mines with him to examine them. And um, he's writing in here about how the miners love her, because she went down into the mines, about how she gets along with people from all classes, meaning um, economic station in, in life. Um, and he ends it with, know her, worship her, love her which is just really adorable. <laughs> oh, Nutcracker. Thank you, Philip. Yeah, I think you're right. The, the name of that mine is Nutcracker. <laughs> but yeah, that last line. And no other has the intelligence, nor judgment, nor disposition, nor loyalty. Um, it's just a really, really romantic entry um, that he wrote into her journal there. Uh, I think I've got it on screen there. Let's see if I slide it a little bit this direction. It, it won't be behind my head. Um, that's really nice. I, I like that we found that. That was, I didn't know that that was gonna be in there. And I'm sure he knew who his audience was when he was writing it. Um, but yeah, it's pretty awesome there. Um, backers from Island up north arrived with a uh, baby boy with broken leg. Oh, she's also added by sailboat. Backers from island up north arrived by sailboat with baby 
and boy with broken leg, all five put, uh, uh, put up in doctor's rooms. Beautiful weather, out all day. Kim and me, uh, Kim and Mr. Going started early and walked across the island and visited every promising looking every promising looking something on the island. Kim very tired. Again, I can't make out that word, this, this word here. But, um, so they had some people come over from the island and she arranged to get them medical treatment. One of them was a boy with a broken leg. Um, <laughs> I'm just gonna leave this note for her, yeah. So, like, this is just, it's available to the public. It's described on our website. If somebody is looking, they would come across this. But unless you actually pull it out and take the time to sit down and read the entries that are in the diary, you don't realize that there's, there's a story in here. <laughs> I think Wraith, uh, Wraith said earlier something about that it would be really interesting to animate this diary. Um, and it's because piecing together day by day the things that were important enough to note down, which um, some of them are not really big events. They're not super important. Like noting, hey, it rained all day. Um, just basic observations about her life, some of the things that she was involved in, some of the things that she did, mentioning going to the theater, um, taking a trip down into the mine. Uh, the information that's in here tells a tale, um, but it mostly just sits on a shelf waiting for somebody who's interested to come in and take a look at it. Uh, there's, there's often this narrative that shows up um, of somebody discovering something in the archives, something that's been hidden away in the archives. And we don't hide things in the archives. They're, they're present and we've seen them, but our job is not to write about them necessarily. We're not, we're not historians. We're not digging through reading everything that we have. We created a guide that says, hey, we have this diary from Olive Treat, and here's some basics on who she is. And it describes these general topics from her life during 1897. And then we put it on a shelf so that if somebody comes in and wants to use it, we can pull it out and give them access to it and, and they can use it. Um, me pulling it out for stream and sitting here reading through it, there's great content in here. <laughs> it's very interesting and very compelling and, and it would be lovely to sit down and just read this diary and read about the life of this woman from 1897. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> that's not what I get paid to do, uh, except for two hours a week on this show when I get paid to actually look at the content of some of these things and explore it as though I was um, coming in from the outside and, and experiencing it. So, <laughs> still easier than trying to translate archaic Japanese to current English. Uh, I believe it. Uh, cute little slice of life snippets that you can see being turned into a webcomic or something like that. And, and that would be amazing and that would be a wonderful um, a wonderful way to use something like this, um, lift up the hi the history that's that's here because there is definitely history here. Um, but also, like I think of things, uh, this is an um, an academic archives, and so I look at it as 
we have this here and part of the primary reason that we collect things is that they can be used for instructional purposes. Um, I mean, we collect them because we're archivists and we collect things on certain topics. Um, mining being one of the topics that we do have collections related to. So I'm guessing that is why we have this diary, is that it had something to do with mining. Um, but as far as like instruction with this, I would look at it and be like, it's a diary and it doesn't really align with lots of the things that we try to ins support instruction for. But they couldn't get any other way. thinking about interpretation of a work like this for illustration purposes or for like that idea of turning it into a webcomic or into a short animated video or something like that, this is great source material that could be used for somebody who's learning how to direct a short animated film or like they don't need necessarily to go and find a screenplay. They've got some content here. They could turn it into a comic. Uh, or if somebody's just trying to work out how to build a screenplay um, and needs some content to work out the mechanics of that, here's a story. Lay it out as a screenplay. Um, so just finding ways to actually take some content like this that's interesting content um, and use it creatively for educational purposes, I think is, is really an interesting idea. Um, how amazing would it be to show a classroom a comic based on a few of these entries and have someone get interested in the life from there? Exactly, Wraith. Um, and for me, like, I, like I said, I think I may have pulled this diary once before because it was a diary from a woman from a date range that somebody was looking for. And I probably pulled it in like two or three other diaries. Um, and I don't know if they ended up using this one at all. And that's the only time I'm aware of that it's been used, but I mean, that's the only time that I've pulled it. It's probably been used before. I, I don't know, I would have to dig into our circulation records to find that out. But part of this show is sharing what we've got. Like, I probably never would have looked at this diary weren't, were it not for this show and wanting to pull something interesting uh, to look at. Oh, here on April 25th. Arrived Seattle at 6 a.m. Breakfast at Butler. Kim and I Lounged about hotel all day. Kim and Mr. Uh, Mr. Blewett attended to business. I took a walk and we dined at Rainier Grand Hotel and called upon the bakers after dinner. Left by Great Northern at four o'clock p.m. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna look for May 4th. Her anniversary was on the 4th somewhere. February was eight months. March, April, May, June. Sometime around June 4th, I think June 4th would be their anniversary. <laughs> yep, it'll be June 4th because the May 4th entry, 11 months today, two exclamation points. This is the first time, first entry I've seen that had exclamation points in it. Uh, Downtown all day with Kim, took the walkers to the theater and annex afterward. She doesn't say what show, she, what show this time. 
May the 6th, beautiful weather. Mrs. Uh, Brower called? I called upon Mrs. May, Mrs. Shepherd, and Maud. So, Wednesday, May 6th was a visiting day. Oh, I've got more entries from Harry, it looks like. Returned call. Huh, something, I'm not making out the full sentence, but stayed home, I got. Mr. and Mrs. Woodruff called. I'm curious, I'm very, very curious about why he's writing this entry instead of her. Came home from the office early in the afternoon. Took my lovely little Bonnie for a something ride through South Park. T-A-U-D? Tandem. Thank you, Kira. I think it's Bonnie. Took my lovely little Bonnie for a tandem ride through South Park. Met Mr. and Mrs. Crouch. Stopped a... Th stopped a... Stopped on... On? That's weird. Uh, stopped at their house a moment on way home. Evening home. I think it's at, but it it's just, I'm used to her writing now and that's not what her T's look like. But also, why is he the one writing these entries instead of her? There's no indication as to why it switches. Bonnie went something starting about 3 p.m. Went to Washington Park Club, spent the afternoon pleasantly, pleasantly there, stopped for dinner, so Walker dropped in and took dinner with us, stopped at Walker's, a few moments on the way home. So, and this time, like, like these are from his perspective. It's not talking about what she did. I just don't know why he's the one doing the entries during this week. Like, it's, it's maybe she wasn't feeling well, but it, it's also possible that this is from her perspective and he's just writing it for her. It's just curious that they don't mention it. It's he just does the entries. There's no because <clears throat> the entry before the handwriting changes doesn't say anything about her not feeling well. It just says beautiful weather. And that she went calling on various people. And it's like two days after she had her 11th anniversary or 11 month anniversary. So That is quite interesting to me. I, I don't know why. And this is like, like two weeks. And then May 18th, there's no entry at all. What 
happened on May 18th? I need to know. Okay, now I know. If I had access to a time machine, I would travel back to May 18th, 1897, just to find out what Olive Treat was doing that day. Because there's no entry, and now I need to know. <laughs> the diary arrived this morning, and I wish my Kim had brought it instead of sending it. So, she didn't have the diary with her, and he was making entries in the diary during that time and then sent the diary to her. I'm very confused. Matinee at Daddy's Circus Girl to Pain Girls Dago Papa and I. Also, I want to know who Dago is. This is not the first time she's mentioned Dago. And that's definitely D-A-G-O. But I want to go to their anniversary and see what happens on their anniversary. June 4th, 1897 was their one year anniversary, which we have determined. <laughs> And there at the top of the day, it says, married one year today. Got up at 9.30. Oh. Of course, it's going to be one of the harder ones for me to read. Uh, I congratulated, oh, no. Got up, at one, got up at 9.30 and congratulated ourselves upon our... Mutual happiness. Drove down to the office and both came back in time for luncheon. At which we had a pint and drank to our continued joy and love. Yeah, I think the 18th was when it was in transit, right? Um, just 107. Is that the cost of the pint that they bought? I haven't seen numbers in here before, so I'm not sure. Uh, at four, we started out for a horseback ride and rode for three hours, coming back too tired to dine too, too tired to dine out, so we had our dinner, served in our room, and finished a very, very happy day. God bless. Uh, oh, sorry. God bless my darling husband. Amen. So still happy after a year. That's good. But then a couple days later, and it's back to him writing in the diary. <laughs> so she may be traveling again. I'm uncertain. I'm, I'm jumping ahead to July 4th because I want to see if she continues the tradition of noting how many months they've been married after the first year has been completed. And it appears that no, it was just the first year where she counted every month. Mrs. Friedlieb, uh, Kitty and Mark, Emily, went to church. Mr. Ward rode up from somewhere on his Wheel. Wheel? Looks like wheel. P 
played a few something in the afternoon. They had music in the evening. I can read that sentence. <laughs> they played something in the afternoon. Hannah, thank you for that. I didn't, like, it didn't make sense to me, but I, it, it makes sense that that would be it. So H Hannah is saying that wheel was just another term for bicycle. going to pick another one at random. Also, it's just amazing to me that this book is filled all the way to the end. Like, used, actually used the entire journal. And so many times, like, notebooks and things have writing on just a couple pages at the front and then there's nothing. So to have actual entries every single day is just amazing. Huh. So, for a long time, bicycles were just called wheel. I did not know that. I love, I, I usually learn something new every single time I do this stream, so I really enjoy that. Um, Give them a satisfaction Kim and I slept until 11 a.m. Played a little tennis. Mrs. Lewis spent the afternoon with us. Alex Mellon came up. And I, so this is a high society lady in 1897. Mellon would have been another high society family. <laughs> Um, I definitely, that's a name that sticks out to me. <clears throat> anyway, I'm, I'm going to, um, stop reading from the diary there because we are nearing the end of the stream and I do want to just say a few words before we end. Um, uh, I want to thank everybody who came by today. I want to thank 16-Bit uh, Eric for the raid, for bringing people over for archival adventures. Um, it has been lovely looking at this diary from 1897 with you all today. I wasn't sure whether it would work because I had not seen the diary previously, so I didn't know if I'd be able to read any of it. Uh, thankfully, I was. I did have a box of other material here to use just in case I couldn't read anything because um, I didn't want to sit here for two hours saying, I can't read any of this, but look at how pretty. Um, anyway, uh, we are two months into this experiment of, uh, of doing archival adventures, and it has been lovely. I've really enjoyed being able to share some of these materials, s see them myself for the first time, but also um, share it with all of you out there. Um, Hopefully, I will see you again in the future. Uh, this show is made possible because of Virginia Tech. Um, the main channel for the show is uh, Virginia Tech's Twitch channel, um, the VTUL Studios channel. Um, so definitely give us a follow there. Um, on that channel, we do have a bi-weekly tabletop role-playing game show called The Role of Play, uh, Friday evenings at 6 p.m. The next episode, I believe, is coming up uh, not this Friday, but the next Friday, and it should be me running a game of Lasers and Feelings based on Elizabeth Moon's Vada's War series, so a space opera, um, which should be a fun time. Uh, between now and then, I will have another episode of Archival Adventures coming up next Wednesday at 2.30 p.m. Um, I will be looking at the August Dietz Civil War collection next Wednesday, so stop on by and we'll see what's in that collection. 
um, that would be referring to the American Civil War, which is one of the main collecting areas that we cover here um, at Virginia Tech. So that is going to probably be everything I have to cover today. Let me see who's on who we can send a raid over to. Um, and you know, we've got a couple options here. I'm gonna say, let's see. Um, I usually try to do like an educational stream of some sort, but, but let's see what we've got going on. Um, Monterey Bay Aquarium has the open seas cam on today. Um, or we could, we could do some Stardew Valley over at the North Carolina State University's libraries. Um, Hannah, thank you for coming. It is lovely to have you here. Um, Wraith, it is also wonderful to have you stop by. Everybody who's been here lurking and just listening, it's, it's always a good time. I think I will set up, um, a raid today. I think we're gonna go Monterey Bay Aquarium um, for the open sea cam. Some nice uh, relaxing background noise for whatever you've got left this afternoon. Um, but thank you everybody for joining. I'm gonna click on the start raid commands here. Um, Thanks. I hope to see you again next week for more archival adventures. Uh, like I said, it is lovely having you here, and I will see you all next time.